my name is Jason Wendell. Welcome everybody uh, uh, to the our panel. Uh, this, we are the Global Development Incubator, and we're talking about um, creating livelihood pathways for people on the move. Uh, our team, the people on the move team, is myself, Ting, Ben, and Paul. I don't know if you want to quickly just say your name, say hi. Hi everyone. everyone. Glad I'm to be King. here today. Hello. It's great to see, by the way, a pretty broad. Um, group of people from all over the world here, it looks like, which is amazing. I'm seeing Uganda, Dominican Republic, uh, Kenya, where I used to live for six years, very exciting. Um, Uganda, Brazil, Geneva. So it's wonderful to have you all here. What we'll do, I'll give you a quick sense of the agenda. And then as we, um, as we start, <laughs> Hearing some music there? Okay. <laughs> uh, as we get started, uh, we're going to hand off different parts of the agenda to our team. And what I'll do is when I first hand it off to our team, I'll have I'll have the, the speaker. It'll be mainly, mainly Ben and Ting. Just say a, a real quick introduce, introduction to themselves so you know who we are personally. Um, uh, but yeah, the Global Development Incubator is a... Uh, an incubator that launches new social impact initiatives that we think can have a uh, chance for global systems change. I've been a director there for the past seven years, working on issues ranging from agricultural finance to anti-trafficking work and uh, modern slavery. And then the last three to four years have been really focusing on issues around migration. Uh, prior to that, I lived in Kenya for many years and worked with Dahlberg. My background's in economic development, um, and uh, and uh, have uh, worked in smallholder finance, uh, in uh, SME finance, in um, education uh, and and uh, national poverty reduction strategies, etc. Um, but migration has been my passion actually throughout the time, uh, and it's really the last couple of years when I've had a chance to to dig deeper on it because we think there's a lot of opportunities globally. To, to make some pretty big changes uh, to the status quo, which we're excited about. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit about who we are, the research that the Global Development Incubator team has done over the past, um, over the past year, really. We're gonna then talk about some of the scale of global migration, global mobility, that uh, as part of a, a landscaping study that we've done. We're going to look at a human-centered framework for people on the move. So a lot of the work that we're doing, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, but a lot of the work we've been trying to do is addressing or de-siloing the, uh, the work that's often separated by refugee categories like refugee or labor migrant or trafficking victim. And uh, we came into this last year of work looking for ways to kind of get outside of those silos. Um, and... Uh, uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about the pathways we see for greater economic inclusion for people on the move, and then talk about where we're where we see opportunity, what we're doing, and calls to action for um, practitioners, researchers, and funders working in the space. And in a couple of these areas, we'll stop and have a a longer uh, break. Great. So GDI has been working around the world for. Uh, about, I guess, eight or eight or nine years incubating transformational social ventures. Uh, we've launched, actually now we're up to 70 of these, uh, ranging from agriculture, climate, innovative finance, et cetera. We have offices in Kenya, Hong Kong, the US, and India. And recently we've added a seed fund uh, to enable us to, to get into the earlier stages for things that we're incubating. So we will we'll do discovery work, and design work with with ideas that are that are at really early stages, and then we move into a build uh, build and exit process. Uh, you can think of us a little bit like Y Combinator for the for the nonprofit space. Um, we've hosted also a number of funds as part of that work. We were help we helped set up the Co Impact um, and uh, Unorthodox Philanthropy and a few other uh, funds. We currently host the Agency Fund, for example. So what we um, what we found out of our work is that we actually had, in the process of doing incubations, identified a number of programs or projects uh, that touch on people on the move, but in different ways. So at the bottom of the screen here, you can see the Migrant Resilience Collaborative, 
which is very much focused on internal migration in India. We worked on the self refugee self reliance initiative that is, um, <laughs> excuse me, that is focused on a lot of a lot of its ur urban refugees, but re refugees in general who are trying to figure out how do we create um, livelihood streams and pathways for refugees. Labor mobility partnerships, which works with creating new safe and legal labor mobility channels for workers typically without a college degree to work in OECD countries. Malengo, which enables, uh, and we just brought this on as part of the current people on the move work, uh, but they enable students from Sub-Saharan Africa to study in Europe through income share agreements. The Refugee Investment Network, which is trying to bring private sector um, capital or private capital, investment capital, in to support refugee uh, initiatives, refugee businesses, and also uh, ranks countries based on their opportunity opportunities they're creating for refugees. And then lastly, the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery, which is uh, a fund that's focused uh, on uh, ending modern slavery, as it says, <laughs> but, but um, uh, very much oriented around, uh, in, at least initially, working on the what needs to happen at the business level, what needs to happen at the government level with rule of law, and then how do we better uh, uh, help survivors. And uh, now it's it's morphed into a, a very uh, a survivor led and survivor focused uh, global network uh, global coordination initiative. So uh, because we had we had touched on these areas through different initiatives, we found that there actually was not so much coordination between, for example, people working on the refugee space versus people working with labor migration uh, or people working in anti trafficking work. And we felt that there might be a need to look a level up. Uh, and figure out is there opportunities, what needs to happen for people on the move in general. So the people on the move phrase is 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 meant to to convey that we're not we're trying to get away from the traditional categories and just focus on look, these are people, they're on the move. And um, a lot of times you can actually be a trafficking victim or and a labor migrant at the same time, or you can be a refugee and a and a and a, and later on, uh, a, a, a labor migrant, uh, people's documentation status goes in and out. And ultimately, uh, there's a lot more in common with people on the move than there is that separates them based on these traditional categories. So with that lens, we went into a global landscaping of what's being done currently, uh, where do the issues stand? And we had some initial funding from the IKEA Foundation to, to take on this global landscaping. We have done a number of multi-stakeholder initiatives in the past, and I think we we had sort of a uh, hypothesis that maybe there's a need for a multi-stakeholder initiative coming out of this, but we really went in with an open mind. And, and what you'll see is that we've evolved a little bit in our thinking, and ultimately where we're, where we're coming out is, is that what we need more is an elevation of this issue, uh, in particular, the economic inclusion of people on the move, that is their ability to access legal and safe work and movement. Um, and and a need to 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 bring much greater resources into this issue, this issue. So we would argue that relative to its impact, um, the funding to in, to to economically include people on the move is probably the most underfunded area in all of global development because the amount of people that we're talking about and the amount of potential impact on their lives and incomes is massive, and the amount of uh, funding going into it is really uh, tiny in comparison. And so that's been a big focus of us, especially the last few months. So I'll just state a couple, what seems like unrelated facts that we see actually as all part of a, a narrative. So I don't know how many of you have heard about this, but about a month ago, there was a massive strike of nurses in New York uh, and they weren't striking primarily for better pay. They were striking because of staffing shortages. There simply were not enough nurses for them to be feel like they could do their job uh, well and deliver quality health care. And people felt like they were burnt, being burned out uh, by the process. Uh, similarly, or relatedly, last year, about 60 million uh, pounds of fresh produce rotted in the fields because there was no one there to harvest it. Uh, at the same time, the number of people in forced labor has continued to rise to 28 million. Meanwhile, 12 million refugees have waited in exile for at least five years with little to no access to employment. And the number of refugees 
obviously it's much bigger than that, but that's just the ones that have stayed uh, for over at least five years. And lastly, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, three times more young people are entering the job market every year than the, than the number of jobs created. Right now, there's 140 million people that are ages 18 to 35 and are unemployed. And the number's growing. Um, currently, about 3 million jobs are being created and uh, 12 million youth are, are being added, 10 to 12 million youth are being added to the, to the marketplace. Uh, to the labor market, but the estimation from the African Union is that eventually uh, these countries would need to create 22 million jobs to absorb the youth entering the, the marketplace. So <clears throat> all these things, some of them don't seem necessarily connected, but from our point of view, it is linked because basically what you have is a massive demographic shift happening around the world um, where there are simply not enough young people in OECD countries, and there are tons of young people in uh, low and middle income countries. And with that kind of differential, you have people trying to seek opportunity in whatever way they can. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I worked for many years with the Global Fund and Modern Slavery. And when you speak to people that have been in forced labor, what you ultimately find in at the beginning of almost all of their stories is, an, is a job offer, an offer to either a job offer or an education offer in a place away from their home. It may not be across borders, but a lot of the time it is across borders. And what starts out as a new opportunity ends up turning turning dark and, and, and abusive, but it's that need and that economic desperation that often drives um, the ability of people to exploit those, those who are vulnerable. So, as I mentioned, we conducted a global landscaping. This is uh, some of the countries we've worked in. Actually, we've added a few more in terms of people we've been speaking to. But we tried to hit every region in the world, uh, talking to both uh, what might be called receiving countries and countries that tend to be sources of, of, of migrants. Um, and then the dark red countries, we were able to do field visits and, and speak to um, a lot of people on the ground. We had a a strong priority to talk to people with lived experience. So we really wanted to understand the perspective from uh, individual migrants and displaced people. We, we conducted a number of focus groups and interviews while we were there. And this has continued um, even as we've shifted into the current work that we're doing uh, around mobilizing uh, greater resources. So that's just a, a basis for where we're coming from and some of the work we're, do we're doing, we've done. I'm going to hand it over to Ben Savinen. He's going to talk about the numbers of uh, giving a sense of kind of like what's the global issue look like uh, from a very high level view. Then uh, Ting will walk us through um, the human centered framework that I mentioned that we pulled together, uh, as well as some of the barriers and pathways that we uh, we think that exist. And then I'll talk about uh, the the next steps and where we where we're going from here. So Ben, why don't you uh, take over? Sounds good. Thanks, Jason. Um, hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I'm happy to be here today. My name is Ben Savinen. Um, I'm a senior associate at uh, GDI, um, coming from uh, a number of different backgrounds and uh, and recently getting uh, doing some deep dives into this work with migration. I'm very excited to be here and part of this event today. Um, so I want to take a minute, though, before we move on to get a sense of kind of the scale of what we're talking about. Um, yeah, if you go to the next slide, please. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so Jason mentioned, uh, you know, when we say people on the move, we're talking about lots of different, uh, lots of different types of people, um, who, who are experiencing and, 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 and encountering um, similar challenges. Um, but when we start considering like who this is, we start seeing what a massive, um, what a massive challenge and opportunity this, this might, uh, this might present. Um, you know, if we if we take together all these different groups, um, you know, the, and these are numbers coming from UNHCR and, and the ILO, um, we see, you know, about 46 um, million people who are refugees and asylum seekers or similar uh, in a similar boat, perhaps Venezuelans abroad. Um, this includes uh, Ukrainian refugees um, and, and other people who are, are currently stateless in some way. Um, factor that in along with those who are, are uh, migrant workers working across borders and, and then uh, perhaps their families and friends um, and other people who are, are traveling, uh, perhaps as students as well. And then according to um, some recent research by Gallup, 
you factor that in along with another 900 million people uh, around the world who say they would prefer to be able to move across borders um, if they're given the opportunity. When we kind of factor all of this together, um, this is this is almost one in seven people globally um, is either moving across borders uh, or, or wants to be able to move across borders and perhaps can't in some way. Um, which is really a staggering number. And, and we're only talking about across borders here as well. Um, this doesn't include the many people who are, are internally displaced um, or, or um, internally migrating um, and, and have to move from one part to another of perhaps the country where they're, where they're living in. So when we're, when we're talking about people on the move as a whole, you know, refugees, asylum seekers, trafficking victims, you know, this is, this is a really large chunk of the population. This isn't a niche issue. This is one in seven people. Um, and, and this is really just a snapshot of where we are right now. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, as, as we alluded to where things are headed, um, these numbers are only going to grow. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. There we go. Um, these numbers are only slated to grow uh, over the next 30 years. Um, you know, we talked about some of those demographic shifts. Um, people in higher income countries are, are getting older. Um, we're already seeing labor shortages emerge in, in, in a lot of countries worldwide um, where, there's, where there's not enough people entering the workforce um, to be able to maintain economies. And, and, and as populations get older, there's, there's not enough people to even to be able to take care of the elderly populations in many places as well. Um, by 2050, we're estimating that that there'll be um, at least 400 million more workers needed in higher income countries um, that that simply won't be there based on all the trends and where everything is headed. And on the flip side, as we alluded to as well, uh, this we see in lower income countries, um, the population growing faster than the number of jobs um, are. are. And uh, while, while those gaps are already in the, the tens of millions now uh, by, by 2050, um, the, we estimate it at about half a billion people um, in, in lower income countries, especially sub-Saharan Africa, um, needing employment uh, and, and not being able to get it locally. Um, these two numbers, I, I just find are quite, quite um, stark, just how kind of how balanced they are. The fact that there is going, you know, there's this need for employment and this, uh, this, this, this need for um, uh, people being able to fill into the workforce. We see this, this just massive imbalance that's continuing to grow and grow and grow, uh, and will likely continue to experience more pressure too by climate change. Uh, we don't know the, exactly how that affects all the numbers at the end, but we know it will be another pressurizing force um, that will likely make this imbalance even greater. Meaning that migration is going to be an, an, an inevitability. It, it's going to be a, a massive need um, that that will um, define the decades to come as we get to the year 2050. Great. Um, I think I'm going to hand it to Ting, but uh, bonus points for anyone who can in the chat guess which is the country on the left, which has that population pyramid, and which is the country on the right, which has that population pyramid. And then maybe I'll announce it at the end of the. Uh, at the end of the seminar. Great, Great. so as I mentioned, we wanted to look at uh, the, across the different silos of people on the move through a human centered framework. So Ting's gonna walk us through that. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for taking us through the numbers. Uh, so hi, everyone, really glad to be here as well. My name is Ting, I'm currently a consultant at the Global Development Incubator. Um, previously was involved in field building work and philanthropy and social impact in East Asia and was based in Kenya for most of my time um, in the People on the Move initiative. Was also briefly in Lebanon last year where um, we were working with Palestinian and refugee, Syrian refugees on the ground as well as vulnerable local populations uh, on basic care and health interventions. Um, so moving forward with our presentation, um, I would like to take us through what we developed um, as we call a human-centered framework to think about supporting people on the move based on their human-centered needs and not just their legal status as refugees, as asylum seekers, as traffic victims, or as labor migrants. And throughout our work, which involves a lot of analysis, as well as speaking with people with lived experience themselves, which I'm really glad to see also some of our participants um, have lived experience of um, displacement as well as migration, um, is that we found that most interventions for people on the move, um, they fall under more humanitarian interventions that 
uh, address needs related to basic survival, but this can be a problem in the long term as aid dependency forms and as these aid funding depletes, as we see in the case of um, aid for Afghan and Syrian refugees with the more recent conflict related to the displacement of Ukrainians. So furthermore, we also found that programs that support people on the move, they're frequently siloed by their population categories, as we mentioned, refugees or labor migrants. And this is despite blurred boundaries of these categories, as uh, Jason previously touched upon, these people can simultaneously be a labor migrant and a refugee. And a labor migrant, for example, is extremely prone to become a traffic victim um, in the short course of unfortunate events. So these boundaries are quite blurred, and we feel like Although these silos can serve legal purposes, they can also limit opportunities for collaborations on common challenges across the field, as well as um, shared learnings that can benefit uh, all the people on the move. So we're really calling on practitioners as well as everyone um, working on issues related to people on the move to take a more human-centered and holistic approach um, and a more sustainable long-term approach to supporting these populations. And, uh, with this framework, we hope to create um, more opportunities or insights for practitioners to um, engage in more cross-siloed learning across sectors um, or across migrant categories and ensure that the, all of the needs of people on the move are met and allow for other fields, for example, youth engagement, um, youth employment to see new opportunities to uh, see ways that they can also engage with supporting people on the move. So based on our global analysis of current efforts, as well as speaking with over 100 people um, with lived experience, uh, our framework basically highlights five common needs, and they're often interdependent areas of um, human aspirations, choice, capability, dignity, voice, and inclusion. And before I go into the nitty gritties of what each of these are, I want um, those that are in the room today to kind of think about as I talk through these, what are some ways that these areas play a part in your work? You know, where do you think there are under-focused areas that you think more work needs to be done, whether in your organization or just across the field? And what are some cross-sector or cross-migrant um, categories of partnerships that can be formed with other organizations that can better accelerate your goals so that we're not all working in these, um, you know, small efforts or siloed efforts to um, promote the same goals? So I'll start with choice. And um, what we found under the choice category is that 60% uh, of global income and inequality is determined by uh, one's country of residence. Um, and people from low income countries are basically limited in their choice of where they can pursue a livelihood or where they can pursue greater security um, based on these stringent immigration regulations that's come up. And we also found that for refugees specifically, the average displacement is now um, up to 20 years. Um, and 70% of refugees living in countries where they are uh, displaced have restricted right to work. So with these limited choice, um, it basically runs counter to what we would deem as um, decent justice for these group of people. And we believe that all people, no matter of their legal background or status, um, should have the agency to pursue a better future without discrimination that's based on their national identity. And moving on to voice, um, we found that through our research, a lot of the decisions about people on the move are made without their input, and they're kind of treated as a problem to solve rather than someone with the agency to influence decisions that influence, um, that concerns their overall well-being. And um, we've seen an effort to kind of localize the development across the field to do so in terms of channeling more efforts towards migrant-led um, organizations to address issues in their communities. Um, and also more higher level um, efforts, for example, having uh, migrant or refugee representatives um, active in the UN space. But um, in doing so, we want to shy away from um, simply a tokenization of these um, people with lived experience and um, advocate for uh, meaningful representation so that um, more of these long-term efforts can incorporate um, the voices of people on the move so that they can influence decisions regarding their own well-being, um, as well as seek redress from potential uh, risks that they may face in their migration journey or um, as they become uh, settled in their country of residence. And before I go into inclusion, I wanna talk a little bit about dignity. 
Uh, with dignity, we found that because, you know, as we mentioned, with limited choice, migrants have limited alternatives to livelihood pathways, um, and they have limited opportunities at home to seek employment just because youth unemployment can be as high as 50% in some places. So they essentially take these very high risk pathways, um, irregular migration, paying smugglers to kind of get to one place to another. And that leaves them particularly vulnerable to trafficking, exploitation, or even abuse from the states. Um, and we've also found that migration deterrence programs, for example, UK recently um, implemented policies to stop migrants and asylum seekers from arriving irregularly on boats. And we found that they're not only an attack on the dignity of individuals, but they've also been kind of um, failed in terms of uh, their goal of deterring migrants, because with people with limited choice, they will take these risks, um, whether they be, um, you know, sometimes risking death, their life savings to um, seek a chance for a better livelihood. So um, with that, we would like to advocate for uh, more protection for migrants from abuse, um, from these um, lack of choice basically that they face through the expansion of more ethical, safe and legal pathways of migration that protects their dignity and rights. And moving onward with capability, um, we found that marginalized populations, not just people in the movement in general, have a very difficult time accessing education and knowledge that can open doors for them, especially if they want to migrate across borders. So um, even as um, you know, the choice for people on the move are expanded. It's important that they have the necessary capabilities in the forms of skills or knowledge gained or networks to access better livelihood opportunities. And capabilities is actually an area that we've seen um, receive a lot of attention from funders and practitioners. Um, but we see also see a lot of um, siloed small scale efforts, as we mentioned, that are not really learning across the field or learning from each other. Um, for example, a lot of these youth employment programs, they're teaching skills that would be relevant for um, potential migrants as well as refugee-led population, refugee populations as well. And um, some of these shared learnings can be better, um, uh, better communicated across the field to kind of avoid duplication of work, um, as well as better to integrate these populations um, into local or cross-border job economies. And lastly, um, we want to talk about inclusion because um, it's basically uh, what we would like to reach once all these other pillars of um, human needs are met. And um, we believe that inclusion of um, migrants or displaced populations um, need more efforts from both the public and private sector to um, drive uh, the efforts in terms of offering products or services that can uh, foster greater inclusion of these populations, or um, taking into account more subnational efforts like what we've seen the mayor's council um, do, which is um, leading more city level responses to uh, address the needs of people on the move living within the city so that they can meet basic needs in terms of accessing housing, schooling, health care, or finance um, to make sure that they're really thriving in their host economies and kind of contributing um, to their host communities as well. So moving on, um, this is basically just what we gathered from the inputs of um, migrants and refugees that we've spoken to across our work. And I kind of wanna just take a look at this to um, really demonstrate what we mean by um, a lot of these uh, pillars are interconnected and really like one cannot occur without the other. So if we look at um, what we have under uh, dignity, um, a lot of people mentioned that um, their dignity are being under attack in terms of, you know, sometimes uh, when they're going to um, pursue labor migration opportunities abroad, they're not even treated as human beings. And, you know, when they seek um, redress or access to justice, um, they might not even be able to gain their dignity because um, they're not really well um, protected. So this really links to, I guess, the lack of choice um, for migrant and refugee populations when they're trying to access these livelihood, livelihood opportunities. So for these Kenyan labor migrants that had no choice but to go to the Gulf because um, 
when we spoke to these uh, returned migrants, a lot of them faced um, abuse when they were abroad in the Gulf, but they all of them, um, I think about 95% of them still wanted to return because they really had no other choice um, for other livelihood channels or migration pathways. And there's very limited um, opportunities for these lower skilled labor migrants um, in Kenya. So basically they had to go back to an area where there was a high likelihood where they may face abuse again. And then Jose, a migrant rights advocate that we spoke to in Guatemala, um, mentioned that you know even when people kind of seek these opportunities to access their dignities um they are not very well protected and um sometimes you know they get put on a black list that further limits their economic exclusion um and uh, prevents them from further opportunities to gain livelihood access um and then if we look right on choice um we found that um a lot of these re uh, refugee populations like Ali, a Palestinian refugee um, that we spoke to who was previously based in Lebanon, but is now um, a working professional in Poland. He believed that um, refugee populations or just migrant populations in general should have the freedom to decide whether they want to take the skills that they've gained to um, move or uh, move abroad to pursue better career options or to choose to stay um, wherever they're based, but it's really important that they have this uh, freedom to decide um, where they can pursue these livelihood opportunities. Um, and in relations to voice, we saw a lot of interconnections um, between um, the importance of voice in terms of shaping better capability programs um, that would be able to address the uh, demands of the labor markets, but also the individual aspirations of um, refugee populations. Um, as one uh, refugee leader in Uganda mentioned, you know, I have we have bigger dreams and aspirations that are greater than something just like tailoring, which is um, a lot of what these capability programs would offer to um, these uh, migrant populations. So um, essentially, um, we think the basis of this framework creates a great foundation for um, prompting people in the field to kind of seek opportunities for cross-siloed um, learning and collaborations. Um, again, ensure that um, the holistic needs of people on the move are met at any point in their journey, whether they be in transit, whether they be in uh, a initial arrival or a more long-term settlement um, in their country of residence regardless of their legal status, and um, would also prompt more practitioners outside the field of uh, refugee um, and migrants uh, support to kind of see opportunities to kind of support people on the move because um, a lot of other uh, programs that are addressing um, livelihood opportunities for vulnerable populations, a huge chunk of these populations are either um, migrants that are already in the country or, um, you know, youth in the country that are potential migrants in the future as they seek better livelihood opportunities abroad. So I just want to stop here in case anyone had any reflections or questions regarding the framework that we just went through. And again, um, please feel free to share in the chat you know, in what ways have you yourself or your organizations have taken account of um, maybe some of these areas in your work and where do you think more efforts should be um, put to kind of address the holistic needs of people on the move as we mentioned. Okay, so someone asked, can you elaborate on one example of how did you address the holistic needs of people on the move? Um, so for this piece of work, um, it's more of um, I guess a more uh, field building kind of research that we've done to um, prompt practitioners in the field that we've spoken to to create more opportunities to collaborate across the field. Although um, Jason did mention in the beginning a couple of initiatives that um, GDI has incubated ourselves. Um, so Jason, would you like to elaborate on how some of these initiatives like Malengo, for example, may have um, kind of holistically addressed um, these five different needs in your work. 
Sure. Are you able to hear me right now? Yeah. Okay. My apologies. Every time I try to click mute or unmute, it uh, it flips the slides. So I'm still getting used to the, <laughs> I need my extra monitor. Um, so yes, uh, I, I think that uh, what we're trying to what we're trying to do is figure out uh, how different organizations are meeting these needs, and then think about the interactions. Um, one interaction that that we think it is important we've st started to hint a little bit to is the link between choice and dignity. So, for example, we work with organizations. There's an organization called Labor Mobility Partnerships. Uh, Labor Mobility Partnerships is trying to create more choices for migrants. So they're trying to uh, establish uh, occupation specific pathways into high income countries uh, like elderly care or um, uh, hospitality sector or retail sector. But uh, the in order to do that effectively, if you're going to create sustainable, politically supportable pathways, th they can't be uh, run in a way that disrespects people's dignity. Uh, I mean, obviously, simply be from the overall point of view of delivering the best impact for migrants, but also from the point of view of maintaining the necessary support for these programs. And so uh, when, when LAMP went into this, this uh, area of creating new channels, uh, they had to also develop a, a, a simultaneous capability around ethical recruitment and dignity uh, and processes to, for example, um, uh, understand worker voice in the in the course of their recruitment experience and their working experience. And I found that pretty interesting in that um, this was an area that a lot of anti-trafficking organizations have worked in. Uh, but but some of the early anti-trafficking work was often meant to deter migration or at, at least to uh, tamp down the desire to migrate. And 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 a lot of times the way it uh, it has it has gone is let's tell people about all the risks of migration and then maybe they won't take these really really difficult migration pathways but but as we talked about earlier without choice without opportunity uh, those types of messagings don't work and so so choice and dignity are these two needs that really kind of are like flip sides of the same coin and and as we see organizations kind of combining them we we see. Uh, more success. I think another kind of interesting pairing is between voice and capability, as a number of those folks mentioned in the quotes. Um, uh, efforts to equip people with skills that don't really take into account kind of where their where their aspirations are often don't really don't really bring them to the to the place of um, of being able to kind of build the capabilities they need. And then if you link voice and capability to to the market demand, which is really critical, uh, then you can kind of incre increase choice alongside of that. So for example, language, uh, in a lot of cases, it's, it's the language training is really critical to opening a lot of opportunities when it comes to mobility pathways. Um, and, uh, and so kind of as you piece together these different kind of uh, needs, you can, you can develop solutions that cover all of them. Um, the one thing I'll just say is that we don't think that every or every intervention or every organization has to do all five of these needs, but it's it's a framework we, we think should be kept in mind as people approach the need. And then a lot of times it might mean that there needs to be partnerships. So if you think about inclusion, you might be enabling uh, migration opportunities, but if you don't, if there's not like housing, low cost housing, for example, on the other end, you have kind of a break in the chain, but but if you're an organization that's that's facilitating the mobility, you might not be in the business of providing low cost housing, but that means you need a partnership around low cost housing. Uh, so the 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 way that the framework's meant to work is to think through, okay, like what are the pieces of the puzzle so that we're that we are meeting all these needs, uh, and then um, and then how do we get that, whether it's through partners or otherwise. I see um, Arena Nachinova, your, your hand is raised. Uh, uh, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you so much for the presentation and uh, for all the work that you do. That is very, very important. Um, I think my question is just, you know, a little bit based on uh, my very modest knowledge of the complementary pathways and pathways of refugees. I know that it takes more than, you know, a refugee and NGO funding and then just um, accepting your organization, whether it is a private company or a university to bring the people on the move um, in the host countries in the safe spaces 
it just takes a political will as well and uh, mm -hmm. um, adequate uh, legal framework. So do you work in this direction in any way? Because, um, well, as I mentioned, you know, I, I assume that getting funding is way more easier than convincing people to change the law. So there would be an additional protection, um, legal provisions that protect refugees or allow them to enter the country because they continuously face problems like getting visas or getting flights from one place to another and uh, entering the country, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, just do you work in this direction at all? Sure. And I can make a, uh... A couple of statements, and I think actually we'll address some of it also as we go forward. But yeah, it, globally, there are a lot of places where you know po policy change is the number one barrier, and w we think that that's actually been a reason why some donors have stayed away from the whole space of economic inclusion for migrants because this their sense is like, what can we possibly do about policy change? Um, now, I think there's a couple of things that can happen uh, and, and need to happen, and I'll do a high-level preview, but then I think we'll touch on it again as we go through. So I think, firstly, we need to demonstrate what can work in the countries that have already made pathways available. Uh, so some, the, some countries have more pathways than others, but not all those pathways are being used. Uh, five or 10 years ago, people would have thought that Japan is one of the most closed countries in the world, but actually the, the level, the policy change pace at Japan has been really uh, astonishing. And it's driven by labor shortages because when people can no longer find, um, you know, anyone of a certain age to, to, to be part of the labor force, they start to shift even like centuries old perspectives on migration. And I, but at the same time, there's a lot of like, there's like hundreds, hundreds of thousands of unused visas into Japan. And one of the major barriers is that people don't know how to speak Japanese. Uh, so. So one solution is like where the pathways are there, where the policies have shifted, let's then pour in the resources that we need to demonstrate that they can work. Because if we can demonstrate success in places where the pathways exist, we can use that success to then lobby other countries who haven't yet changed their policies. Uh, I think another area is that we do need to invest in narrative shifting. Uh, and there's some really interesting work out there on that. There's an organization in Spain called Por Calza, which has done a lot of work on trying to shift narratives and that's a long play like it, it takes the, the distance between changing narratives and changing policy can be many years but it, we need to be investing in it um uh, and then i think that there are coalitions of actors uh that can be developed especially with the private sector especially by sector that can um maybe avoid national level political disagreements so even in the us which is highly polarized politically there's some agreement within certain sectors like agriculture, healthcare, um, increasingly elderly care that we need to create uh, legal pathways. And so sometimes by moving the issue away from the national polarized politics and into industry level needs, you can make some progress. And there's a few other things, but we'll, let's, let's, uh, let's go a little further and, and we'll come back to it. Because I think what you're asking is really a, a central question. Uh, Ting, why don't you uh, continue? Uh, uh, but we'll tr we'll try to go at a little higher level for some of these slides. Great. So, uh, next slide on barriers. Oh, yeah, so essentially, um, in addressing um, the people, the needs of people on the move, we've identified a couple of restrictions on legal movement as well as um, employment that limits um, people on the move from reaching their full potential. As I mentioned, um, in relations to limitations on choice, a lot of people from lower middle income countries are barred from living or working um, outside their nation of birth. And um, only a tiny fraction of the whole 900 million people who want to move across borders can access opportunities to do so legally. So a lot of them um, take on massive risks in terms of getting into um, black markets for irregular migration, which can cause tragic consequences. Um, and these huge number of displaced populations are displaced for years on end with restrictions to work um, and restrictions on asylum in which countries they can apply for to settle long-term um, because 70% 70, 70 of them, as I mentioned, have no right to work. 
uh, in their residence, uh, in the country of residence prior to resettlement. Um, and despite these barriers, we recognize that, you know, there are transform transformative um, outcomes, both for on the individual potential level, as well as economic benefits on the country level for both sending and receiving countries if um, more uh, labor mobility um, migration pathways can be expanded. So on the individual level for uh, migrants or refugee migrants, um, there's a over 10 time income um, gains for marginalized populations if they were to seek opportunities in areas that are more higher income. And this dwarfs the impact of aid programs that are pouring into a lot of these countries. Um, and on the more macro level for the sending country, um, because of uh, the mobility of these people um, through um, sending remittances as well as resources that these countries can benefit indirectly from due to increased trade investments, there is um, an opportunity for poverty reduction at a large scale. Um, and also there is um, opportunities for more increased peace, conflict, and security as a lot of these unemployed youth are um, have getting into pathways for more meaningful employment that kind of theaters them away from um, instability and engagement in future conflict. And for the, um, in the end, for these um, receiving countries we talk about, this solves um, critical labor shortages for them, as well as um, the injection of migrants creates complementary jobs for uh, complementary local jobs, as well as um, ensures more security provision for sectors that are in dire need of more human capital, like elderly care in a lot of OECD countries. So here's where we think, um, where we pose a vision for the future, where um, we think we want to see a world where people on the move are no longer face this thematic economic exclusion when they try to pursue a better livelihood. And with this um, framework, we want to propose a field level strategy to shift the global status quo um, towards more inclusion for people on the move. And we've identified basically three preconditions um, that would uh, realize this vision. So people are prepared to create shared value away from home. We want to facilitate more ethical actors safely to safely and transparently facilitate the movement and employment of people on the move. And we want to um, advocate for more um, governments as well as um, policies change advocates to encourage governments to implement policies that are conductive to legal movement and employment. And with the next few slides, we would like to take you through the six impact pathways that we've identified to reach each of these targeted outcomes. So for target outcome one, people are prepared to create shared value from home. There are two pathways that we've identified to um, reach this outcome. The first one is better training and skills recognition um, mechanisms for uh, certifying the, skill, the skills of um, migrant populations and better training to basically upscale these populations. And where we see this come into play is we wanna see more investments in market-based training programs. Um, so more demand-driven programs that take into account in, of labor market demand needs or um, cross-country labor market demands to kind of focus training towards these areas, as well as Jason mentioned, um, more focus towards soft skills and language that could be important to kind of facilitate the, more of these cross-border mobility um, pathways. Um, we also want to see the more development of industry-specific skills recognition and uh, accreditation programs. So if we see um, a lot of these um, refugees, when they're moving from one place to another, or uh, migrant populations, um, their previous skills in their home country may not be recognized in their new receiving country. And we want to create mechanisms, um, promote more mechanisms that would kind of accelerate that process so they don't have to start at square one again. Um, and we also want to um, promote more um, of uh, development and um, cross sharing of jobs data technology tools or curriculum across the silos that we mentioned, like youth employments um, and actors, so that um, there can be more cross learning and um, shared learning across the field. And um, throughout our research, we had a couple of bright spots that we have identified uh, organizations that are already working in some of these um, areas that we mentioned that could um, better promote uh, the realization of it, this impact pathway. And um, one organization we identified 
uh, over here is something called the Global Skills um, Partnerships, which is basically a migration model that promotes um, bilateral labor migration between labor sending and receiving countries in which um, labor receiving countries have already done a comprehensive mapping of the skills that they would need. Um, and they take these uh, necessary um, kind of uh, skills and they uh, fund training programs in um, migrant sending countries. Um, so that migrants that receive this training can upskill and they have a greater access to choice in terms of whether they want to pursue a home track and kind of take the skills um, and remain where they're at to kind of engage in the local economy or in a way track that um, opens them up to more migration opportunities. And currently this is being piloted in Germany, Belgium and Australia and hopefully in other areas in the future. Um, the second way we see that this pathway can be realized is to promote um, greater access to financial services uh, for people on the move. Um, one way we see this could be done is to more um, policy change um, and greater uh, efficient policy implementation. So, um, for example, in some areas uh, in the European Union where um, all uh, legal residents, including refugee populations, are um, a, are supposed to be able to get access to basic bank accounts, we see that there's an even um, implementation of this directive um, across uh, different EU states in terms of um, maybe only a couple would have um, national level legislature and even within um, countries that have national legislature on that, you know, uh, practices among banks may differ um, depending on their understanding of um, these regulations, um, as well as general understandings of the needs of displaced populations. So that's where we lead to the second bullet point where we think there also must be increased um, resources towards educating financial service providers themselves on adequately serving the needs of people on the move. Um, and for people on the move themselves, in order to better access these opportunities, we want to um, promote what we call just-in-time education for them um, in terms of having um, adequate education at a time when they most need them to be able to take up these opportunities as well as um, come up with more long-term um, smart financial planning for their future that is more robust. And then lastly, we want after speaking with experts, um, a lot of them have wise in terms of um, instead of developing, you know, specialized products for uh, uh, people on the move, refugees or migrants themselves, that we should be making more efforts to integrate them into the mainstream financial products. Um, and one of bright spot that we found in this area that unfortunately is not currently um, outside of uh, Africa yet is um, something called uh, the Leaf Digital Wallets, which basically facilitates the economic integration of vulnerable unbanked populations that frequently move across borders. So this includes refugee populations to help them better access um, financial services across borders, as well as um, help them build their digital economic identity. And this service is really easy to access. Um, they're one of the few financial services that open, uh, accept refugee um, ID cards. Um, this can be accessed via any mobile phone, doesn't have to be a smartphone. Um, and it's available in the languages of um, displaced populations, making it easy for them to connect and kind of better integrate with the local, um, more mainstream financial economies through this service. I will now pass it on to Ben to take us through um, different pathways that would lead, lead us to our um, uh, other outcome. Great, thanks, Ding. Um... Yeah, so so the next target outcome that we want to take a look at um, that that's been informed by our work um, is this idea of movement employment being safely and transparently, both of those words being key there, um, by ethical actors. You know, if we're, we're going to see an increase in migration, we need to make sure it is something uh, that is that the the movement itself um, is is being handled in a way that that uh, is um, you know respecting those those aspects of choice and dignity in particular uh, that we address in that human needs framework. Um, so we, we, we've spent some time looking at pathways that can enable uh, movements to be um, positive in this regard. And we have two pathways here in particular I'd like to take a look at. Um, the first one is cross-border livelihood search and matching. Um, so they, this is really about that transparent piece of this tra transparent and safe. This is making sure that someone who's looking to move is able to understand um, what the opportunity is, um, as well as perhaps the potential employer being able to understand what the skills are from someone uh, who, who would be migrating. 
Um, so this is, this is about bringing those connections, making sure the information is flowing well um, across both groups, making sure um, uh, both the employer and, and prospective employee have, a, have an understanding of what they're getting into and, and the terms and, and how they would work together, uh, making sure everything is, is above board, so to speak. Um, and, and make sure everyone has the information they need for the actual um, for the actual transportation as well from getting from one country to another. Um, and we and this is this is critical and I think this really ties into a lot of the other things that we've talked about. You know, some elements of this tie into uh, what Ting was just talking about about uh, better credentialing and recognizing the skills that people already have. Um, this we see how this pathway overlaps with that idea. Um, but we also see how this overlaps with the idea of of um, of the safety element, which we're about to talk about, um, because transparency just makes it hard for unethical actors to be able to um, to be able to take advantage of of, of people. Um, two bright spots in particular uh, that we wanted to highlight um, were, were Just Good Work, which is which is an app um, that uh, right now is, is primarily focused on Bangladeshi workers who would work in the Gulf region, uh, providing them with, with uh, a lot of information about potential work opportunities and kind of guiding them through that movement process. Um, and then another great example of, of great work being done in this area is Talent Beyond Boundaries, um, which is a global organization doing some amazing work of, of um, connecting with both employers um, and refugees um, to understand kind of the skills and needs on both sides and kind of how they can uh, how they can be lined up with one another and 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 trying to make that matching happen. Um, this is an area we'd love to see more work, but these are two great examples. Um, the next pathway I'd like to take a look at is the the the, the safety side of that transparent and safety uh, that we talked about, uh, responsible recruitment and employment. Um, this is an area where we um, you know people who are migrating are often uh, easily taken advantage of um, because they don't have that transparency piece, because they don't have the information that they need. Um, we see things like high upfront fees, as you see in the quotes here, advantage, you know, examples of people having their passports taken away from them. So they're effectively um, uh, trapped where they are, um, people not getting their pay. Um, we think that as, as migration grows we, and we want to make sure things are safe, we need to make sure that the people who are facilitating this work uh, and facilitating migration um, are doing so in an ethical way. Uh, and so this really, there's two sides to this coin. This is making sure that the people who are doing it well uh, are being promoted and are being rewarded for that. And this is making sure that the people who are um, who are less ethical, the people who are, are taking advantage of people are, are being held accountable for that. And, and while that those things can be done perhaps uh, in, a, in a legal framework, it, it's also something that can be done economically and socially, um, making sure that uh, that employers are recognizing who a responsible um, uh, recruiter is. It's making sure that employee uh, that that people who are on the move are recognizing who the responsible actors are to work with, um, and, and and therefore you know they would be getting more uh, more traffic and and more. Um, uh, more business because they're doing things in a positive way. So some of the bright spot examples we have here, the Fair Employment Agency, Ethical Recruitment, uh, and, and uh, the Ethical Recruitment Agency here in Sierto um, are examples of organizations that have done some great work in creating positive incentives um, for, for those who uh, are, are, are doing their work well, who are recruiting well, um, and, and, and really trying to promote those alternatives um, to those that may be more possibly damaging. Um, yeah, so our third target outcome, which kind of gets to the question that we had just a few minutes ago, uh, is that is this idea of governments needing to implement policies that are conducive to legal movement and employment. And this is the big one, you know, this is the one that has has a major impact uh, on everything. Uh, and this is also the one that uh, that is uh, perhaps been more difficult to tackle globally. Uh, but we do see this as a critical piece uh, moving forward and something that will need to be addressed. Um, and so we have two pathways in particular, which, which we already started talking about, but we'll dive into a little bit deeper here. Um, the first is is policy change itself, right? Like for migration to be able to happen safely and, and effectively and to increase, um, policies will need to change. Um, and this is something that it, it's 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 really going to have to happen globally. We, we need to be we're going to have to be able to see changes happen uh, on the receiving side. Um, we're going to have to see. Uh, more openness, as as Jason alluded to, examples like Japan. We see some examples of this already, um, where 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 countries are starting to open up a little bit. Um, but we need to make sure that uh, the the pathways for people to to migrate are are being handled uh, well and safely, and and that those countries are facilitating them well. Um, we also can see space to make this process, um, you know, uh, perhaps a little bit smoother on the sending side as well. 
you know, Jason mentioned how one of the barriers to being able to um, have increased migration to Japan is language. Um, we start to, we've been starting to see examples of, of countries who are sending people, uh, people who, uh, countries where people are migrating from, providing training to kind of help facilitate that transition a little bit easier. So in the case of Japan, perhaps having language training before people are able to go, creating opportunities for citizens who are looking to uh, migrate out of a country to be able to prepare for their journey and to make themselves uh, able to um, uh, more smoothly integrate into a different economy. Um, and then, you know, and we want to make sure that as well that the policies that are in place for people who have already moved but don't have the ability to work, um, people, refugees, asylum seekers, people, we mentioned that 70% who can't currently work where they are, uh, we need to be able to find ways to kind of loosen up those policies as well. Um, our bright spot here we have is actually one of our incubatees uh, lamp, uh, which really is take um, really addresses this issue from a, from a wide range of angles, very holistically, and trying to um, you know do some coalition building uh, as well as um, kind of working on on the kind of the social side as well of of, of being able to identify these opportunities um, uh, for for affecting policy change even if indirectly at times. And then we'll go to our last impact pathway, uh, which is effective policy implementation. So there's two sides to this, right? We need the right policies in place, uh, but we also need policies um, that are being implemented well. And this is something that we encountered in a number of uh, the interviews that we had with our research too. Um, there's a great you know, quote here and, and a number of people stating how perhaps there's policies that were already fr friendly to people who are migrating or refugees, um, but not everyone's aware of it. Uh, perhaps the moving population, uh, the migrating population is unaware of, of what the policies are. Um, perhaps uh, perhaps uh, employers in the, in the receiving country um, are able to uh, hi hire um, migrating people, but they, they're unaware of what the rules are on that side too. Um, so when we do find uh, examples of policies that are good, we need to make sure that they are that everyone is aware of them and that they're being implemented well and effectively. Um, and so, you know, this this is this is about better communication. Uh, this is about making sure people are have think, are, are aware of all these. Um, but this is also making sure that policies are being enforced and actually um, and actually being carried out the way that they are intended. Um, and this is this is something that includes you know working with a variety of of um, employers and, and facilitators along the way. Um, and our bright spot example here is the National Skills Commission, um, which which does some great work um, in Australia doing uh, making sure that the, this type of work is communicated well. Um, so this just taking a step back because we, we went through those six pretty quickly. I wanted to take a look at kind of again how this all fits together. We see these six pathways as building towards these target outcomes. Uh, which are all necessary towards this uh, reaching this ultimate vision of um, ending economic exclusion for people who are on the move. Um, but we wanted to take a pause for a minute and ask a few questions again and, and, and see, uh, you know, any thoughts that you all may have or any comments. I saw that there's a few in the chat that perhaps um, we can address. Um, but if anyone else has any comments on these six pathways or thoughts or, or anything they'd like to add, we have a few prompts here um, as well. Um, uh, you know, one of which getting to something we've already talked about a little bit, this idea of this uh, this this policy change being being an area that's a particularly overwhelming, um, and, and if, if you've seen any examples of, of people being able to do that well, um, or examples of people being able to communicate policies well, we'd love to hear any examples of that, um, or any general questions or comments you have on this section. Uh, we're open to that, uh, whether you prefer to use the chat or raise your hand. Yeah, I see we have a couple of raised hands. Um, Ellen. Hi, thank you. Um, I think I, Irina was actually first, but I can quickly jump in and, and then let her go. Um, so thank you so much for this presentation. My name is Ellen Lee and I work with the Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration at the State Department. Um, I thought this presentation was really interesting and I hadn't been familiar with uh, your organization before. So I'm very curious to learn more about your role um, and specifically your relationship with the incubatees, I think you were calling them. Um, so that was one question I had. And then another thought I was um, that came to mind was, I was wondering if you were familiar with uh, the World Bank's World Development Report. Um, as uh, the topic for 2023 is focused on migration. And actually, I think a lot of the 
um, findings from your research align very well with this report um, that will be coming out, I think, in a month or so. So I just wanted to make that linkage there. And um, also just to say that one of our main partners is the Refugee Self-Reliance Initiative. So it's it's good to see that you're already working with them. Um, and um, I guess in response to one of your questions as well, the first one in terms of what we need um, to be looking at policy change, I would say that one thing that has been useful in our advocacy and diplomacy has been evidence. So looking at what are the benefits of hosting refugees and migrants and other displaced populations and how they can be contributing back um, to the societies that host them. Um, and again, we're working with partners like the RSRI and the World Bank UNHCR Joint Data Center to uh, be able to collect and disseminate some of this evidence. So just wanted to share some thoughts there. Thanks. Awesome, thanks. Um, to address real quickly uh, to your questions about learning more, I think Jason just posted in the chat uh, a few minutes ago um, some links to uh, uh, kind of um, some published research that we have coming out, um, as well as uh, ways to get in contact with us. So um, take a look there. We can also share uh, with everyone at the end again as well. Um, and then as far as the, the World Bank Development Report, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're aware of that coming out. We're very excited to see that as well and, uh, and, and to, to learn more about what, what's coming there. Um, and then as far as your, your, your final comment about, uh, policy change and evidence, um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and, and actually, I think, uh, we're going to talk at the end here in just a minute, a little bit more about some research that we'd like to see more as well, too, but we'd love if more, any more, um, you know, ideas that you get on that front too. Um, Arena, would you, you have an, me, your hand uh, Oh, go ahead. What, maybe just add one more thing in terms of just kind of who we are, what we're, how we work. Um, yeah, we started with those those initiatives that that you saw at the early part, um, and what what we're we we stick with an initiative for about three or four years typically before we release it. Sometimes it's a shorter relationship; we just help them get oriented. So with RSRI, we what we did there was more of just uh, help them think about how do you do a steering committee to kind of broaden the. Um, the, the governance, but in, in most cases, we're sticking with an organization for three or four years and then launching it. But uh, as we, you know, even in this conversation, we've seen like organizations like Talent Beyond Boundaries, organizations like uh, Poor Calsa, as I mentioned, uh, there's one called More in Common in the UK. We think that there's really, there is an opportunity now, and I think the labor shortages kind of makes it more clear to a number of countries to, to shift things that haven't been shifted in over for many years. And um, so we are one of the main things we're really pushing for, and we'll talk more about this, but is to try to bring more donors into the to the space because very few donors really have a, a deep commitment to uh, migration beyond the the immediate emergency uh, area. And um, so we're we're trying to convene actually a donor table. We've we, we've begun that outreach already, uh, but we think it's going to be important to get more. Uh, more funders coming in uh, alongside of um, some of the policy change efforts that are needed. Great. Um, I'd be happy to continue this conversation. I have some thoughts on why donors might not be as engaged in this space currently. So yeah. I'd be happy to reach out and continue the conversation. Thanks. That'd be great. Yeah, no, I actually would love to talk to you again. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in DC normally. So if you're there, it would be great to talk. I think Arena uh, had another question. Yeah, maybe, you know, just because you mentioned a couple of um, digital based solutions for the refugees, um, you're also working with um, some that you mentioned. And uh, um, on, the, on the part of Europe, I can testify only about Europe because this is where my most knowledge is. Um, there are a lot of, um, well, apps or websites that uh, provide um, refugee to refugee sort of a peer advice on the, um, through digital platforms, any possible ones uh, on where to get the um, uh, opportunity or match um, employees and um, employers and potential employees. But um, it seems to me that, well, first of all, there's a problem of access of refugees to these um, digital platforms. And on the other hand, it also they, they seem to be so small all around the world. There are very um, there, there are very like broad representation across the world of these small initiatives, but they don't seem to quite you know grow um, to your experience and to your knowledge working with this organization that kind of pop up here and there. Um, is it a perspective field? 
so to speak, would it be worse, you know, just kind of look more into these digital solutions for refugees and um, employers? King, do you have any thoughts on that from your Europe experience? Um, yeah, so that's what we've um, been seeing as well, a lot of different fragmented efforts, as well as um, barriers related to language and technology. Um, and unfortunately, that is not a, that is not a path, um, that particular intervention is not something that we have looked too deeply on in terms of how can we um, expand it further to reach more people. But what ha we have seen in terms of um, another pathway in terms of engaging um, more people related to um, peer advice is what we've also seen um, the really engagement of, of these diaspora groups within each countries of regions that have a lot of migrants from a particular uh, country that um, they've also been, you know, extremely active um, in WhatsApp groups in terms of sharing and accessing information. And that's what we've seen um, are more accessible to um, a lot of these migrating populations because um, it's a little bit less low tech and it's more um, of a network opportunity to also engage with um, others that are in their vicinity. So um, uh, that's what we've seen so far. And unfortunately, we don't have a good answer as to um, how can we better expand a lot of these um, different uh, products that we've mentioned. But I think um, definitely there are um, opportunities out there that people have worked on. Unfortunately, most of them are limited um, in the humanitarian space in terms of they're funded by um, traditional more philanthropic donors or by USAID that um, unfortunately have not been super sustainable in terms of their lifespan once the funding dries up. So um, maybe there's more opportunities in the private sector area for um, sustainable solutions to address the information gaps of uh, people on the move. Yeah, and I'll make a, a broader comment. So part of our efforts to kind of convene donors around this issue is making the case that there are uh, early stage innovations in need of in need of funding or that can really solve some of the problems in the space. So we are always collecting potential future bright spots. Um, so if you have any organizations you want us to look into, send us the links on the chat uh, and also at POTM at globaldevincubator.org. We really do want to hear more of what's out there, even if it's uh, an area that we haven't looked into as much. Uh, to we're trying to create kind of a global landscape of where a lot of the bright spots are. So we're very interested in your your input there. Um, and the I've always been interested in kind of the peer network element. Um, looking at it initially, if you look at the way that if you look at the United States, for example, around the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, the way that many immigrant communities ultimately were able to protect people from abuse and exploitation, for example, was through peer networks on the ground. Um, and when I worked with the Global Fund and Modern Slavery, we did a lot of work trying to figure out how do you how do you cultivate these kinds of things because they're really important. Uh, Emma, why don't you go and then I'll um, uh, then we'll wrap up here with the final section. All right, thank you so much. Uh... Uh, actually, my name is Emmanuel. Sorry, I missed that. Oh, sorry. Uh, when, while entering, yeah, my name is Emmanuel Shindi. I am currently in Italy and doing my master's at uh, an Italian university. So uh, I'm actually a beneficiary. I was formerly a refugee in Malawi, but I'm a beneficiary of a scholarship that allowed me to come to Italy. And uh, I was one of 61 students in in in, in the East Africa area who offered the scholarship. And the one challenge that they had was uh, getting trouble documents. So my question is, for instance, organizations like Telling Beyond Boundaries and other partners that you've mentioned that are interested in providing uh, mobility uh, pathways for refugees, how do they find an alternative for issues of travel, <clears throat> of refugees getting travel documents if, if they see that um, there's no political will, there's so much, so much legalities. Are there other alternatives that they are providing? And um, because I face a lot of challenges, a lot of my peers also faced a lot of challenges getting travel documents in, in the countries that were hosting us as refugees. Um, and also um, something that I noticed is like, you know, they are running these programs from <laughs> the US, Italy, in different countries, but they don't have someone on the ground to navigate the, 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 the different challenges that are happening on the ground in terms of uh, receiving these travel documents. So my question is how 
Um, are there other alternatives that these organizations are, are using or are they just backing out, importing their resources in other countries? And uh, is there any steps uh, being taken to get people on the ground to actually help facilitate this whole procedure? Sure, thanks for that uh, question and input. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the issue of documentation is, is one that's really challenging, you know, even in, even in places uh, where policy uh, creates a pathway on paper, um, it sometimes takes forever to actually process the paperwork. And, and, and so the promise that may exist, at least in theory, doesn't, doesn't materialize. Um, uh, you, you can look at some of the challenges with, with special immigrant visas in the U.S., for example, as an example of that. Um, I think the, so the, what we're seeing happening now, you know, organizations tend to focus where they, where they find the opportunity. So it's harder for them to take, start with someone and say, where do you want to go? Now let's figure out the paperwork. Usually what it's currently what people are doing is kind of the reverse, where it's like, where are there interesting channels that we can create? Uh, so what Talent Beyond Boundaries does is they make, um, uh, they, they map sort of the demand and the pathways in the destination countries, Canada, US, you know, a, a number of others. And then they also map, they kind of create a skills database. But uh, but often, the, you know, there can be these, uh, whether it's bureaucratic or other bottlenecks in between. Um, another ex example of that kind of approach, but it's been very interesting, is this organization that we work with called Malengo. Malengo found that Germany would take uh, students with into its English language university programs as long as they um, had 12,000 euros of first year living expenses in the bank. And they also found that there were some high school diplomas, regardless of your, your national status, that the German universities would look at. So Uganda happened to be one of those. So they started their program in, in Uganda uh, and just recently have been able to bring in some refugees that were uh, living in Uganda, but not every, but the requirement there was uh, a Ugandan high school diploma. So it's one of these things where it's like, there's a really interesting pathway, but it started from what worked within the current system. And then what Malengo does is they provide an income share agreement to cover the first, uh, that first 12,000 euros that's needed to get a student visa. And then when they have that mapped out, they, they also provide hands-on support to get the visas and to get the documentation. Uh, so where the, where the pathway is identified, uh, we are seeing, you know, Malengo has a, has a team in Uganda and a team in Kenya working on the ground to help students navigate those processes. Uh, but at present, although we're working actually with them to expand to Francophone West Africa, but at present there are, um, uh, they, can, they can only start initially with the, you know, where the, where the you know, the, in this case, the high school diplomas that are accepted by German universities. So often there are constraints, um, but we think there's at least a foundation to build from. Um, so let me quickly uh, walk, talk through next steps and where we're heading, and then we can take more questions and then try to also stay in touch with you. Um, you know, we're just at the beginning of sort of trying to build a community around this as well. So uh, if you reach out to us, we'll add you to our list so you can get updates and things like that. So I mentioned a few times that the uh, donors who are focused on low-income countries have largely ignored a lot of the uh, benefits of increasing legal and safe access to employment and movement. Uh, so um, if you look outside of, again, outside of the emergency space, uh, only less than 0.7% of ODA is facilitating safe, regular, responsible migration. And much of that is focused on the, on the regularization, which is, which is key, but not so much in terms of like opening up uh, pathways. Uh, and then we estimate, and we've done, this is difficult to estimate, but we've done a global survey of private philanthropy. And we think that basically about 0.5% is going to uh, economic inclusion for people on the move. So, so of all the private philanthropy that's thinking about development, global development and low-income countries, only 0.5% is, is thinking about economic inclusion. Uh, uh, and uh, so these numbers are just really, really small. Given, again, the beginning numbers we talked about, uh, 300 million people on the move already, another 900 million that would like to be, uh, you know, I've talked to some major donors and they said, oh, like, but what you're talking about is such a niche issue. Uh, but from our perspective, if you look at 
the the number of people times the massive amounts of economic gains like it's 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 actually quite large and yet the funding is very small so uh from that starting point uh we mapped out the different types of funding so thinking about the same six pathways that we talked about or the three target outcomes equipping individuals ethical facilitation and policy shifts we think there's you know different types of pathways that, uh, of funding that can that can support this work but early on we do think some innovative or innovation grants and flexible money is needed to to first demonstrate what's possible and then we think that bilaterals can come in for example especially in the uh, on the left side, when we talk about equipping individuals, there's a lot of funding already going to things like job training, livelihoods. If we can establish the links between that work and cross-border movement, we think there's there's opportunity where where bilateral and aid agency uh, aid agencies and traditional foundations can really support that work. Uh, there's been a little bit. USAID has done a little bit in Central America um, uh, to, to access some temporary labor mobility programs in the US, uh, Australia, uh, the DFAT in Australia is funding some of this work um, for residents of the Pacific Islands who are work, looking to work in Australia. And then German, the German aid agencies have done a little bit of that as well. The other area for that kind of money is in policy implementation. But again, it takes this early, uh, early work needed to kind of set it up so that the, so that the, uh, so that the, the bigger funding can come in and help execute. And then we think impact investment, patient capital can actually support businesses that work on things like ethical recruitment or access to finance. Uh, and as Ting was mentioning, private sector solutions that we think can be sustained over the long term. Um, but uh, to get there, we do think some more demonstration is needed. Uh, so we've been proposing and we're looking now to kind of stand up uh, uh, a donor table or a funder table with an idea around a global mobility fund um, focused on the income gains across borders and, and investing in the field. We would break it down by innovation seeding. And that's what I was talking about in terms of we'd love to get your ideas of entrepreneurs or innovators, especially based in the global south or uh, refugees or, or migrants uh, that, that could use small amounts of funding to seed and then for the existing efforts that there are, we think there's opportunity to scale them. And then alongside of that research to, to fill some of the evidence gaps. What, where we're at with that is we need to raise the initial, um, the initial infrastructures, the initial money we need to have kind of this, the, the backbone or the infrastructure uh, for, for, for this fund. And then once, once we have that, we're able then to try to pull together funders for larger Larger commitment, so it can be a long journey, um, but uh, we we think it's needed to sort of spark and catalyze uh, movement in the field. And then uh, we have identified already some of the areas where we we think more research is needed. Uh, this is not comprehensive, but we, working with folks like CGD uh, and others in the field, uh, we we try to identify some of the biggest gaps that we think are important. So. Firstly, on the impact of migration, especially on migrants themselves. So better, better documentation of household income gains. There are some you know, great, great papers on this, but just more empirical work on this would be, would be great now that people are starting to move, at least in smaller numbers, uh, to document really what those household income gains are. And I, I think also factoring in cost of living. Um, looking at the long-term social and economic impacts, uh, of emigration and return migration on low-income sending countries. So for the most part, the evidence is pretty positive, but uh, there's more nuance we think that could be developed in understanding how to maximize, you know, for example, how do you maximize the use of remittances and investment or diaspora investment? Um, how, do you, how do you address any short-term labor impacts, things like that? Um, and then the indirect and direct effects uh, of right, migrants and refugees on low and middle income host countries, especially where informal work is pervasive. Uh, effective intervention. So this is more of the, the first, maybe the what or the impact. This is more of the how. So uh, what, is, what makes for effective use of or integration of refugee voices and migrant voices? Um, what are the most effective policy change efforts? Uh, so I talked a little bit about narrative change. It, it, a lot of times it, it can be hard to 
to measure the impact of narrative change, but, but more research on kind of what it works better and what works less, less good when it comes to advocacy and narrative change, uh, we think is important. Um, how have people- Jason, not to, sorry, sorry to cut you off. We, we, uh, we do need to wrap up for time uh, okay. from the organization. Oh, wow. My gosh, it's yeah. already 9.30. I didn't even see. Okay, effective policies, uh, also really critical. Um, and then uh, our call to action for practitioners, which we've already gone over, but it's thinking about the full range of needs. And then for people that are not working with people on the move, we think there's a big opportunity to include migrants who have been vulnerable to uh, who are sometimes among uh, the most vulnerable within vulnerable populations. And uh, a lot of work that's focused on just livelihoods in general hasn't fully understood the, that the, the, what could be done for migrants in their midst, as well as including cross-border opportunities when we talk about livelihoods and training. So that's our call to action. That's our next steps. Um, and as we've said, we'd love to hear more from you and, uh, sorry, we ran out of time so quickly, but, uh, it's been great to talk to you already and, and we're, we'd love to continue the conversation. Thank you. Really, that was a really fantastic presentation and it really sets the stage for the sessions that will come next more, you know, more detailed about it, about economic integration, different pathways where refugees can be employed, looking at digital livelihoods, looking at the creative industries. So we have a lot more sessions around this. So we, we encourage you to join. In half an hour, we've got another session on the creative industries as a pathway to employment for refugees. Again, looking at the digital, the digital economy. And we have lots of other sessions happening throughout the month of April. Thank you for attending.